at this one here. This is, this is hide and seek post exploitation style by TJ O'Connor and Tim Tomes. <laughs> So let me be the, uh, I think, what, uh, the fourth or fifth person here to welcome you to ShmooCon 2013. No snow. It's beautiful outside. No snow again this year, so we're all thankful for that. Um, th this is the hide and seek talk. So if you found yourself in the wrong room, please stay because we think we're going to have some fun here. All right. As this fine gentleman just said, my name is Tim Tomes. Uh, I'm a senior security consultant for Black Hills Information Security. I'm also a security blogger, most notably Paul.com. I cross post some of my stuff to Landmaster53.com. A uh, veteran of the U.S. Army, Christian, and I love to code. Uh, one of my most recent projects is the Recon NG Framework. Some of you may or may not be familiar with that. It's new. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, there are my Twitter handles up there. Um, please, uh, please keep an eye on that for future updates to this and other projects. Here's TJ. And uh, I'm TJ O'Connor. Uh, pretty much what I do for a living is fall out of airplanes. <laughs> Someone please hit that guy with the schmoo ball. All right. I also uh, just authored uh, my first book, uh, Violent Python. Someone can have a copy. And uh, I used to, I was the course director of computer exploitation at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And Go Army. <laughs> Go Army. And I'll uh, hand the, back, the mic back to Tim. So we're going to get this thing started with a, uh, with a quick video. This is in real time. I'll create a GUI interface using Visual Basic. For those of you that didn't hear that, she said she was going to create a GUI interface with Visual Basic and try to track the something or other by IP address. Okay. <laughs> Right. So this, this, this film is good for a couple ways. One, because it breaks the ice pretty good. It's funny. It shows the, the ignorance of American television. Uh, but the second thing that it does is it, is it presents the important point that hide-and-seek is still alive and well, and it's not just a kid's game anymore. Okay, so we've all played hide-and-seek before, but let's, let's quickly review the rules. All right, so you've got one or more people called hiders, which attempt to conceal him or herself. And you have one or more seekers, which attempt to find those hiders, right? Very, very simple. All right, but this concept can be com uh, applied in many different ways, right? You got the, the simple kids game where, you know, one kid counts to 10, the others go and hide, and then they try to find them, right? But there, there are other ways that we can apply this. What about the DOD's attempt to track down Osama bin Laden or the DOJ's attempt to track down child sex offenders, things of that sort, much more serious in nature, but some of the same concepts apply. Uh, now, this is a more modern, much more advanced version of hide and seek. And that's the type of hide-and-seek that uh, is going to apply to today's talk. It's our focus for today. So the rules are the same, but uh, the game is much, much different. It's no longer a game where we only have ourselves as tools. We have a lot of other things at our disposal. We play in this new digital playground where the hiders are concealing themselves amongst the bits and bytes of the Internet, and the seekers must find them there. Okay, so what are some of these, these methods for hiding in this digital playground that we call the Internet, right? Well, we've got stuff like onion routing. Show of hands of those of you familiar with Tor. Show of hands of people that use Tor. Right, good, good deal. Good number of you. So you know what I'm talking about. Anonymous proxies or open web proxies on the internet, right? We can just shovel our web requests through these open proxies, and uh, you know, they're attributable to something, but hopefully not us, right? SSH tunneling and virtual private networking, kind of the same concept here. We're going to pivot through a remote location that we either do or don't control, depending on, you know, the situation. And then uh, probably the weakest version of this is user agent masking. Right? We can change the user agent of our well, user agent and then um, hopefully trick somebody into thinking that we're something that we're not. Okay? But all these tools have been around for quite a while. Right? We're all pretty familiar with these. Right? Not much new here. So the hiders have some options for concealing themselves. We just covered those. What about the seekers? Right? What technologies do the seekers have at their disposal? At their disposal? to uh, leverage against these hiders. Well, we've got thing, technologies, really neat new technologies like HTML5 and stuff that's been around for a while, like Java. We're all intimately familiar with Java. Uh, HTML formatted emails. We've got client-side um, things uh, such as PDFs, 
Those are, these, are, these are payloads that can be delivered client-side. We have client-side technologies and softwares, things like uh, our browsers, the, the actual activities, the, the things that these software do in the background that we can leverage uh, to try to get this type of information to find these hiders, right? And obviously, this kind of this stuff is, requires post-exploitation. We have to have some level of access to the machine, and we're going to cover uh, how that stuff works. But these are all the different technologies that the seekers can leverage to find these hiders. Okay? Now, why this technology exists, quality tools to leverage it don't for the most part. And if they have, they haven't been developed nearly as far as the hiders tools have. Okay? Right now, the hiders have a significant advantage over the seekers. And me and TJ are trying to change that today. Okay, so on the last slide, we looked at some of the options that the seekers have as far as technologies go. Um, and in order to foster some of that, the use of all these different technologies for one purpose, we developed a framework to support them. Okay, and we call it Honey Badger. All right? I don't even know where the real name came from. It just kind of came in our heads one day. I don't even think we named it. I don't think I named it. Somebody just said, call it Honey Badger. I was like, okay, cool. All right. So here it's a server agent architecture. Ta-da. We've got this server that's out there on the Internet somewhere. And then we've developed these agents that leverage all those different technologies and call back to this server with either the geolocation data or information that can lead to us getting geolocation data. And we'll cover more about that as this goes on. All right, and this stores the result in the Badger compliant cloud. So for those keeping track, that's three drinks, all right? No cheating, all right? All right so the different technologies, we had to come up with a common standard for which that they, can, they all had to comply with so that they could communicate back to the server back and forth. And, and uh, uh, everything supports web, right? So we figured, hey, we'll just create a really simple web service and develop a little API around it, and all these different technologies can just call back to the web server over HTTP. And so that's what we did. We created a little really simple API, and what does, the simple, what does this API expect? Well, first it expects you to identify a target. And this target can be, say, a client system that we've embedded several agents on, and so as it calls back, it knows where this information is coming from so we can track targets. Target may also be a web server. So say we own a web server that we can predict a particular target is going to visit. Well, we set this web server up with a particular target. Every time it gets hit by this particular person, then it sends us back and says, hey, this is the target. Agent, obviously, the stuff we're going to talk about for the rest of the day, all these different agents you deploy, we want to know which agents are reporting for which target. So this is how we distinguish between those two. There's an option to put some comments in there if you have some miscellaneous data. And then the next three things is where the tracking information comes in. So there's three different ways that this API communicates tracking information. One, if the agent has the capability of of figuring out the lat long and accuracy by itself, it just simply reports that information back to the, to the server, right? If it does not, if it has the ability to, say, conduct a, a, a wireless survey on the client side, it just shovels all that data back in this next form you see right here. Here's the operating system. Here's all the data. You parse it on the client side, the reason I, on the server side. The reason I do it on the server side, or we do it on the server side, is because if there's parsing errors, at least we still have the data that we can chunk through it ourselves and figure out what was actually sent to us. Right? And then if none of that works, if, or if the agent doesn't have that capability at all, we simply geolocate by IP. Now, we all know that's not very accurate, but it's something. It's better than nothing. Okay. So let's just hop out of here real quick and take a look at what the framework looks like. When you first open it up, it looks like this right here. It says select the target to begin. Over here, you have this list of targets. Here, we'll select demo page. I tweeted it out last night for anybody that may have seen it. Hey, if you want to participate, go to the demo page. So you, collect, you select your target here, and then you have the target locations of all different people that have visited. I had the HTML agent and the JavaScript and possibly the applet agent all, all built into that, and we'll talk about those in a second. And you can see over here to the left, you can select the target. It updates in real time, so as new targets are reporting, you'll see them in here. It's all Ajaxified, right? And then you have this filter for all the different agent types, and you can uncheck these and check these, and it'll show them or not show them. All right, and then down here you've got, hey, here's my most recent hit. Here's my most accurate hit. So it's a good panel for analyzing all this data that the Honey Badger server is collecting. This is where the analyst spends his time. Okay, so that's the control interface. Um, what's the real power, or the, or the real power of Honey Badger comes in its agents, right? So, so these are the seekers tools. These agents are, are the seekers tools that we mentioned earlier. 
And this is where we begin to leverage all those technologies to try to reveal the locations of our target. All right, so we have two main types. One's web-based and the other's client-side. I touched on those briefly, web-based. You deploy them out to a web page or a web server. Client-side is something we get onto, the, uh, onto our, a target's machine, right? One of the base technologies that we're using in all of these different agent, in all these different agents is the Google Geolocation API. Who's familiar with that? Okay. Well, when Google was doing the whole street, street View project a while back and they got in some legal trouble there, that was kind of the beginning of this thing where they started collecting Wi-Fi access point information. Stuff that's public, it's out there, it's viewable, but they were pulling it down and storing it. They began to build this database and then they released Android, right? Everybody has an Android phone. If you've got your location services turned on, you are now updating, maintaining this database through your phone. Okay, so it's an incredibly huge database of, of all this information about access points. And the way we access it is, we give it a BSS ID, which is the MAC address of the AP, an SSID, a, a relative signal strength from where we're at. For every access point that we can see, Google triangulates your position and says, here's your lat long and accuracy. Right? This is the basis of what we're using. And the way we get the information to send to it is the real trick. But this is the technology, technology that actually gives us the lat and long of where they're at. Accuracy is pretty scary. Typically, if you had two, three APs nearby, within 10 to 60 meters. And that's pretty darn close. Almost as good as GPS. Not quite, but almost. All right, so the first type of agents that we're going to talk about are these web server agents. OK, these are the ones that are deployed on the servers or web pages. And right, we try to allure our opponent or the hider to this page so that they are confronted with these different agents that try to geolocate their position. All right, the first one is web HTTP. This is that worst case scenario where all they have, where all they have is just a simple HTTP hit and we try to geolocate by, by uh, IP. HTML5, this is the HTML5 geolocation that's built into most of your browsers. If you've gone to a web page, you've seen a little thing that pop up that says, hey, share location. That's HTML5 geolocation. I ask you to do that, but I don't give you the coordinates. I then send them to my Honey Badger server. Okay? And then there's a Java applet, which, do, which uses the hardware on your system to do a wireless survey of your area and then sends all that information to me. I parse it, send, the, send all, the AP address, all this information out to the Google geolocation a, uh, API, and then I, try, I uh, locate your position. All right, I'm doing all that on the server side. Now, what BH, BHIS is doing, one of the efforts we're making, we want to begin to figure out how to embed this stuff into, inside of your administrative GUIs for things like SSL VPNs or hardware devices that may be facing the internet, right? A lot of those are Java-based. We're trying to find unique ways to embed that because we feel like from a defensive perspective, this could be really useful information for a defender to know who's trying to reach out and touch my SSL VPN. Right? You can ex reasonably expect where your employees are at, but we want to give you a visual and give you some data to analyze and actually determine whether it's a valid hit or not. So we started off with the, the three basic modules or agents that come with uh, the Honey Badger framework, and we expanded upon it, and we, we went ahead and built uh, three more pre-exploitation modules or agents and six post-exploitation modules or agents that are integrated uh, into the, the Metasploit framework. Uh, so what these agent, agents and modules, I guess, is synonymous at this point. Metasploit uses the term module to describe a, a piece of code that, that executes a specific purpose, and agent is, is what Tim's using to describe what reports into the uh, Honey Badger framework. Um, so we basically married Metasploit with the Honey Badger framework. The, uh, the, first, the first module that we wrote stands up the, the basic HTML server. Um, and it attempts to geolocate based on the different techniques Tim described, either using HTML5, HTTP, or JavaScript, or the web applet. And um, it kind of does it with some scary precision. And uh, rather than just talk about it, I'll just show you the demo. Hopefully you can see that. But you go ahead and, and use the module. It's using the uh, Metasploit basic auxiliary HTML server, so you can specify a URI path or SSL cert or whatever. Um, once you stand it up, it gives you an IP address um, to, that you can inject in an iframe or uh, target someone with. Uh, if they browse it, it will try various different techniques to geolocate them. Um, that geolocation will then report in to both uh, the Honey Badger framework and the Metasploit console with the uh, lat long coordinates. And that's what's highlighted up there, if, if you're in the back and can't see, is, is the actual precise lat long coordinates of, of the individual that connected. Uh, the next module that we built, also for before you actually exploit a target, is to build a PDF, Adobe PDF document that can phone home. 
And it uses the Adobe JavaScript um, to go ahead and, and both try to submit a form and try to launch a third-party browser. If you submit a form and you're only proxying your, uh, your browser traffic, then it will, it will escape and show your public-facing IP, which is the intent. It, it reports into the, the Honey Badger framework, and you can see that the user agent for this is not the, the browser, but the actual acro forms used by Adobe JS. The third and last pre-exploit module that is scaringly easy is the, the SMTP image. So most, most email clients actually render HTML just fine, and that's okay because we have a lot of HTML formatted text, but few actually ask for permission to go ahead and fetch some images off, off a different domain. Uh, and so all we do is render a one by one translucent or white pixel on the image on a server of our choosing. So we can send in an email and, and get receipt that someone's seen it and what IP address they're, they're seeing it from. So that wraps up the kind of the, the three pre-exploitation modules. But what's really cool and why we, why we wanted to do it was the exploitation modules. So that we can now take uh, within Metasploit uh, or use the Metasploit framework to create explo uh, exploits that then run our scripts post-exploitation. Uh, so you can create something like a PDF that, as soon as it successfully exploits a target, performs a wireless survey and then reports in. Or create a Java exploit that searches for all EXIF images and their geotags and then reports in. Or create an Excel spreadsheet that, that goes ahead and looks through your iTunes backups for geotag information. So the first is, is, is just that. It, it goes ahead and it does the, the WLAN survey. It enables the wireless card on, on Mac OS, Linux, or Windows and does a wireless site survey and then submits those results of that Wi-Fi site survey using the SSID, the BSSID, and the signal strength to Google to go ahead and get a specific location, and then it reports accuracy. So just a quick demo here. I have an active session. I go ahead and use auxiliary Badger, Badger WLAN survey. It's got a couple options there of where it's gonna report into. I set the session I wanna run it against, and it goes ahead and performs that wireless survey. Tim just said it's platform independent. So it went ahead and found a bunch of wireless networks and then geolocated based off of that to its precise lat long. And, and just to give you a feel for how, how late I was working on my presentation and also how, how precise it is, we were still working on this as flying in last night. So there I am at Chicago O'Hare um, on, on my connection flight trying to still make everything uh, work and, and finish our slides. And it precisely located me right to the airport terminal that I was at. And, you know, just because you probably don't believe me, I also took a screenshot of it. <laughs> Pro tip here, um, if you're ever flying through an airport and you stick a laptop next to a window and start taking photos, You get to sign a personal TSA agent. <laughs> Badger Preferred Networks is, is the next module, and what it does is it looks at the fact that Windows restores restore, both the SSIDs for all previously connected networks in one registry key, and then stores um, with the GUI ID for that in a separate registry key, it stores the default gateway MAC, which in most cases is also your BSSID. After exploiting a target, this one goes ahead and, and looks up that BSSID on wiggle.net. Um, we have to use wiggle in this case because wiggle um, can look for single BSSIDs where when you submit to the Google API for a single BSSID, it just resolves against an IP address. But wiggle is a free open platform and you can use it. Um, so we just wrote a module so you can go ahead and query it for a BSSID. So it's just an other auxiliary module. You set, you set the BSSID, you search. You also set the username and password you want to use, but I didn't put that up here, obviously. And it goes ahead and, re and reports in the lat long of where that BSSID was last seen by Wiggle. Exit find uh, does exactly what it's supposed to do, find John McAfee. <laughs> but it's also a very valuable tool in the fact that after, post after exploiting a target, it will go through your photos, find EXIF tag photos, download those photos, and parse out the, the EXIF tag information to know your, your lat long coordinates. 
So uh, no surprise here, I have an active session, I use it to uh, use the tool, I can, I can set the path and, and how, how deep into the path I wanted to recurse. And it goes ahead and, and goes ahead, downloads the specific images it finds and pulls the geo coordinates out of them. So this was the photo it just downloaded on the bottom right hand corner of the screen of some cyclists. And then here's what it looks like in the Honey Badger framework behind it. Um, it shows you where it reported in in the image and it, it's, it's scaringly precise. You can actually see the, it's hard to point out, but you can actually see the stop sign in both photos or the speed sign. And, and the, next, the next module or agent, we're still working on this to be honest, um, but um, it scrapes your iTunes mobile backup and downloads the, both the binary plist and SQLite databases. And uh, the EFF gave a great talk this summer on how much information gets actually stored in those that shouldn't be stored in those. Um, and some of that information being geodata keys. So I think there's an app called Alarm Clock Free Best Magic or something like that, that uh, for some reason when you first start up, it asks you to use your location and if you enable yes, it marks your, your precise geo coordinates and then stores them in a, SQL, in a binary plist that gets archived on the phone and then in your backup. So all we do is go in and, and just download that plist, parse out the keys that look like they are longitude and latitude and then and then report that in. Your browser does the same thing. If you use something like uh, Maps, like Google, uh, Maps Google, or, or uh, if anyone still uses MapQuest, <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of URL parameters that have information in them, like lat long, geo, geo code information. So all we did is wrote another module that goes ahead and downloads your, the places SQLite database uh, from, from Firefox, and then dumps that against, uh, Known, known parameters that are geo, geotag information. And so here, we're running against an active session. Um, it's figuring out what platform and type you're running it against, and it figures out that you're also running the Firefox browser, what user privileges you have. It sees that you don't have root, so it just goes after the active user. And then it goes ahead and starts down, it downloads the SQLite database that contains your places that you visited. And then from there, it parses out all sites that have geotag information in them. And, it it in. and then it reports it in to the Honey Badger, because it doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so we were worried that we didn't have the word cyber enough in all of our slides. So on the next slide, you know, we, we were helping the guys playing at home. Once we have geo coordinates, we can embraceify our cyber web 2.0 social media strategy. <laughs> so there, there are quite a few web applications out there that, that have very Google searchable APIs that if you, you specify a precise lat long coordinates, it will give you all the social media emanating from a radius around that, that specific point. Um, and listed are some of these up there. So there's, there's one tool uh, that, that Tim released before at DerbyCon. We, we thought we'd flash it up here, but because it's incredibly valuable, it's called Pushpin. It scrapes all of uh, those APIs for social media emanating around a lat long once you found it, puts it in a nice web interface uh, for you to look at so you can see all the social media emanating from that point. And then it also places in a mapping tab. So, this person here. again, you can see how late we were at. <laughs> so, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Because I ran this thing about 50 times last night trying to find an appropriate comment to put in the slides. And then that one finally popped. I will gladly buy you a beer later. Uh, and uh, that, that pretty much wraps up our slides. Let's, uh, since we, I'm going to take just a minute to sort of kind of show you, since we're not actually lying to you about this, it really does work. If we go in here and we like look at this and we want to pull out and say, I just want to see the JavaScript stuff, right? You start to click on these and you'll notice the accuracy varies, right? Some of it's very inaccurate. Others should be pretty accurate. What's going on here, people? Well, you can see the accuracy popping up here, right? Look at this one, like 30 meters, okay? 
So there I got a hit from somebody in the United Kingdom overnight who's obviously not here, right? Who hit, the, who hit this demo page in the middle of the night, accuracy within 30 meters, that's pretty useful information, right? Now this is more of the, the web agents. We go over here, which was the Schmoot test yeah. for the capital. Let me check. If the internet connection is slow, it may take a second to load up, depending on whether or not we even got connectivity. Feel free to raise your hand for questions if you have any. Yeah, question back there from me. Were you concerned about the legality? There we go, right there. Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, most definitely. And did you want to address that? I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right. So either have title authority or some sort of memo that says you're allowed to do that, right? Make it a part of the pen test. Okay. One of two things. Yes, these are us. Okay, no, that was JavaScript, right? So if you've ever gone to a website that pops up and says, hey, you want to share your location? The ones that are showing up on the demo page were those, right? So if you give me that information willingly, I don't see any legal information there. There's also, no, there's also abandonment. However, I did read an article not long ago that said that they're really considering the, uh, the legal ramifications of aggregating the data like this so that people can do exactly this. I don't think there's been any laws passed on it, but I definitely know that they're considering some of that stuff. Go ahead. Do I have to give you all my data, or can I get my own money back to server? It is. Here, let me show you. I'll give you the links to it right now. How about that? You can have your own Honey Badger server, Mark. OK? <laughs> now, uh, I, the repo is still private, so if you try to go there right now, it won't work. I'm going to publicize it. I just forgot to do that before I came up here. Okay, okay. All right, good. No shimmy balls. All right. <laughs> All right. But that's it. If there are any more questions, any, anybody else got anything else? All right. Enjoy it.